musicians in bars getting beer. It's Kevin and Cody, and it's Crown Lands. Yeah. So there's there's two things that we certainly want to talk about, and that's Canada yes. and Rush. Yes. Okay. okay. So we know. <laughs> you know what we do. Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can go over that. So we're here at the Horseshoe. Yeah, um, it's, it's last, well, it's last show ever, and it's our first show of the year. And it feels like it's the passing of the torch because they've been around for 10 years and they've dominated the Toronto scene and, and shown so many up and coming acts what it means to be a hard working live rock band. And you know, we, we've, you know, we've looked up to them and it's, it's really cool now to kind of uh, have a show where it almost feels like passing the torch where it, now it's, it's our time to show the world what it means to be a rock band in 2018. All I had wired in my head for this show was, play good. <laughs> what do you got going on? We just signed with APA. Super excited about Congratulations. it. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. now we're, uh, we're booking shows with Ralph James and Mike Graham, and they uh, two of the most respected guys in the industry. They've, yeah. they've been able to build many bands that we look up to, and uh, we're excited to join that roster and uh, just become part of that scene. Have you played with any of those bands that you're talking about? Yeah, actually. We yeah. played with uh, Palais Royale, um, which is a cool band, uh, just last April? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think we're back doing a couple shows with them as well in April as well, coming mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, yeah. And so what else is going on for you guys? Right now, we're in the middle of writing and recording our next material. Mm -hmm. We're working with a few few uh, really exciting people that uh, have... We cannot say We can't right say now. Oh, right. man, we love the name dropping. Oh, yeah. Not, no, not, okay, not right okay. now. Not right now. <laughs> next, next time, Billy. Next time. Okay, sure. No problem. <laughs> uh, just new material. We're not sure what's going to come out of it. Yeah, we're, we're just writing a lot. You know, now, Obviously, we've put out two EPs in the last two years, so yeah. the, the goal is get a full length out. Um, but also, sure. you can't have a preconceived notion uh, when you're going in to write yeah. music. Whatever it's going to be is what it's going to be. Yeah, so, so we're just trying to write the best stuff we can. Just keep and, writing. Uh, I think we are. I think we're, we're pushing yourself uh, musically, Boy, lyrically. Yeah. And, uh, like from a songwriting perspective, I think we're going to... We're gonna have some really exciting new stuff throughout new shows uh, throughout the year. Yeah, and, and stuff uh, that just gets increasingly harder to play drums and sing at the same time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're not pushing yourself uh, to like your breaking point, then you're not doing it right. Because all of our favorite music yeah. um, is like part of part of um, the experience is the live show and watching like a virtuosic uh, musician doing their thing, and yeah. that's what we want to do. We want to kind of be a musician's band, and we want to use every available limb to make as much noise as we can and yeah, create like a exactly. harmonically complex, uh, musically interesting um, art because there's uh, is so many limitations to being a two piece. And so you so, gotta get creative with it yeah. real quickly. Mm -hmm. And like, how do you break out of that? And like, yeah. how do you make music sound big with with a clean tone and yeah. um, and create something uh, dynamic, rhythmically and dynamic? Um, just in terms of the songwriting, and so that's what yeah. we're going for right now, is trying to create something that's accessible, but fucked. <laughs> and how does that work on your records then? So I'll, I'll just like throw a bunch of stuff with Cody, I try not to come with preconceived ideas for songs, but I'll have yeah. like 20 like a riffs. riff for something, and, like, and then I'm like, yeah, you know what, I freaking love this riff, like it goes like, so many places I can see it going, but maybe if you'd like, you know, maybe if we tried it like with this ending on it or like this beginning different way or something. Yeah, it's, so it's, we kind of riff on each other. Sure. Yeah, or like Cody will come with a sick drum beat and I'll just, you know, yeah. play over it. Or melodies. Melodies yeah, is what yeah. kind of happens usually first. Yeah. And so isn't that one of the advantages of only being two? Because yeah. you just yeah. get in there well, and the, the create. Feedback, the feedback's instant. Like Cody will make a face um, <laughs> if I play something good. And it's just like, like this, like wide-eyed wonder, and it's like, yeah. oh, and it's like, it's, it's like revelatory. And yeah. if, if I play something and Cody doesn't make that face, I know it's not gonna work. Yeah, the tells. And, yeah, but the yeah. second he makes it, it's like, okay, cool, we have a song now. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and then we kind of mid mold everything onto it afterwards through jamming and stuff, you know. Um, I'm really influenced by Queen, Freddie Mercury, and Roger Taylor, voice-wise, oh, yeah. so much. They're just powerhouses, both of them. And Michael Jackson, which is something that a lot of people don't really know. But I, he's, he's what's got me interested in the concept of singing. Wow, interesting, like, yeah. yeah. And I used to like pretend to sing his songs all the time. <laughs> interesting. And uh, Kevin, what about you? Um, 
As a guitar player, um, like my, my my main influences that uh, a lot of people wouldn't know would probably be John Butler. He's an Australian finger style guitar player, and he rocks an eleven string acoustic guitar, and he's he's incredible. That's how I got into modal tunings and open tunings. Oh, right on. And um, Lindsey Buckingham from Fleetwood Mac is an absolute massive influence in terms of songwriting and guitar playing, mm -hmm. and uh, another finger style player. And a lot of people will come up to me after a show and be like, "Wow, like you know, how did you get such a heavy tone without yeah. using a pick?" Because most of our set, I'm finger picking, and that's to be able to create um, like a, a one five uh, bass line with my yeah. thumb, and then still uh, create like a, a melody line to go with Cody's voice. To keep my, a nail on your thumb. No, I like the tone of, of my uh, just my, oh, my just flesh. Your flesh yeah. and, um, when I'm when I'm rocking my my uh, acoustic, I I will throw like a thumb pick and a finger pick on, right. and I just kind of like that 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 freedom uh, to not worry about my nails and my day to day life. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, We're talking about influences. I I just want to talk about what guitars you like using. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I I grew up as a Strat guy. Um, my dad had a, a, a gorgeous 82 blonde Strat, uh, which he, he gave to me, and that's now my main clean guitar when I'm in the studio, and I, I use it for a few songs live right now that require a more sparkling, articulate tone. Whereas a lot of our stuff, it kind of balances between clean and just all out stoner sludge. And that's where um, SGs are, are my favorite tool for that. I've got a uh, an old SG from, from the 60s with uh, T-top pickups, which are like low output humbuckers, so I still have clarity. And then my other one has P90s, which actually are far hotter than the humbuckers. And that, that guitar just sounds like a chainsaw. And uh, I'm caught between the love for single coils and humbuckers. Um, oh yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I just got into using compression in the front end of my amps, where I, I like to, to crank. Uh, most of my tone uh, is, is from my, my amps. I don't really use much processing. I don't use uh, many distortions or fuzzes. I like using uh, an EP booster as a clean boost into the front end, because uh, I think the sound of tubes is always going to be better than the sound of transistors. Yeah. And you want to get that touch sensitivity out of a cranked amp. And that's why I always face the amps away from the audience, so I can get as loud as I want to on stage without hurting Cody's ears, without hurting my ears, without hurting anyone. And that way the microphone uh, gets a very powerful uh, uh, signal because there's something called sound pressure level, which moves uh, the diaphragm of a microphone and creates a very strong electrical current. And it's all about gain staging, right? Whereas if you start out with a very strong signal, um, our front of house guy Justin, who also produces and engineers our records, he has so much to work with in such a raw tone that he can just carve away and doesn't have to build anything then. Yeah, right. and that's that's kind of where um, a, a big part of our sound comes from. And then I also have a keyboard that I play with my feet, and that uh, serves on a lot of purposes. What is that thing called? Uh, a Moog Taurus is uh, like I use uh, a Roland PK5 to just control. Like Yetis, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just like yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, we're going now. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're getting yeah. there. Talk about Rush. <laughs> Rush is I love the great, Rush. Yeah, Rush is the greatest band, band of all time. He's got a Rush tattoo on his ass. <laughs> no, dude, don't tell him that. Sorry, man. now your dad knows. Yeah, my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, dad. So, uh, of course, we can edit, but I don't no, think no, I want to. No, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. Sorry. No, that's great. <laughs> wow, we got an exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talk about your drums, how, how you came across your drums. Or sure, yeah, I mean... Is, you're still using the same kit? I'm still using the same kit. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I got my drum kit that I'm playing now from my father, because he's a drummer and he's been playing for so, so long now, like over 45 years. Wow. Yeah, so he gave me this kit when I was like 13, after I got my... <laughs> after it's a I long got, time, man. Yeah, I know, I know. After I got my, uh, got rid of my first kit, it's like that. Your first kit just holds a special place in your heart. Mm -hmm. um, so this this kit that I'm rocking now is a Ludwig. It's nothing real, like vintage or anything. It's held up right. like for ages, and I've thrown that thing around so many times. I'm thankful it stays together. But um, in terms of the snare that I use, now that's that's a different story. I oh, use. Yeah? I'm rocking a '69 Ludwig Superphonic, and it just cracks like a whip. It's like, you know, it's got such a great response 
and uh, it sounds thick as hell, which is like what we need in our band. Yeah, uh, it's the same snare that. Uh, it's the same snare that John Bonham actually used and made yeah. super super famous. <laughs> yeah, like, but we started. Oh. Out, you had you so got, there's uh, more than just Rush. No, yeah, exactly. Well, well for well. him maybe. <laughs> Well, I, I've had so many different snares. I played like a Slipknot signature snare for a while when I was a metal drummer. Uh, you know, in my metal phase. And, um, just like, you know, the run of the mill kind of stuff. But it, it all came together when I got this like vintage signature snare. It's just something about like the metal body that allows it to, uh, I don't know, just hits that sweet spot that I haven't had in any other snare I've had. But that's that's what I meant by <laughs> taking it seriously till that age. Right. Okay. Um, but so that's when you started getting really drawn towards. Yeah, I was and like, only towards exactly. the drums, really, right? Only the drums. Your dad and I was that, that exactly, and I was that awkward kid at school who would like literally do nothing else but go home and play drums all day and all wow. night. <laughs> yeah. And so, how'd you guys hook up? Um, interesting. I went on like uh, a. a a, a self-searching journey uh, and I hitchhiked to Los Angeles and uh, I lived there for a while but then the day I came back into uh, back into Canada I, I linked up with an old friend of mine who was auditioning for another band that Cody was playing drums in at the time and I, I just I, I heard through the grapevine that Cody was a great drummer and that he was into Rush and I, so I was just like, hey, Cody, um, you know, I, I hear into Rush, so like, I just dropped my pants and mooned him and showed him my, my, my Rush tattoo. And, um, it was instant it was friendship. Like, uh, instant love, yeah, yeah. for sure. And, it's like, I know, understand, like, man. Yeah, like, <laughs> Me too. And, <laughs> so, yeah, I guess, like, you know, three years later, we're still at it, so that's cool. Yeah. Well, it's true, you know, dudes like Rush. But yeah. nowadays, even the girls like it. Yeah, yeah. And you guys are both off the market, right? So, yeah. yeah. So I, I both our girlfriends are, are subjected to like constant rush. Yeah, they like it now at this yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I try. Uh, There's a lot of girls that are forty. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Just as long lineups for the girls' bathrooms yeah. as the guys. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I noticed a, a sea change in the attendance after um, the the documentary came out, uh, mm -hmm. Beyond the Lighted Stage. I remember saw that Molson Amphitheater before it came out and. Wins Rosh was empty, but then afterwards, and I think it, it, it humanized mm. them, right? And it mm. brought them to a, a wider reality that uh, the best fucking guys. Yeah, you know, they're just, they represent everything that we want to be as a band and as musicians because they were consummate professionals and they led yeah. a very clean lifestyle yeah. and they maintained humility and they kept like lives back at home. And that's what we want to do, you know. Yeah. We we want to maintain relationships with our girlfriends and our friends and our family. Yeah. And we but at the same time we want to be as hard working as that. You know, at their peak they were playing two hundred shows a year. Yeah. I yeah. want to do that. Wow. You know? Yeah. And Where are you at now? How many shows have you done this we year? Did, uh, I, sh I shouldn't last, say this year. Yeah, last year we hit seventy. Seventy last yeah, year. We want to hit a hundred awesome. this year. And yeah. where were some of your favorites? Uh, Phoenix. The Phoenix. The Phoenix was, like, was awesome. Last time we course. played the Phoenix was a highlight when we were on tour with One Bad Sun. Yeah. yeah. It was really sick. Yeah. Any other highlights from the One Bad Sun tour? Uh, our, we opened up uh, the tour with a show at Maxwell's in Waterloo, and yeah. we didn't realize we had such uh, an amazing fan base there. Yeah. And uh, it was it was, it was magic. Yeah. And it, it was such a great way to kick off the tour because I just rebuilt my entire guitar rig. And we, we had just figured out how to run like uh, a tourable setup that wasn't um, suited for dive bars. It was more suited for the music halls that we were playing in. And it was just very exciting. And it was um, a reinforcing moment, you know, that, that we we're actually doing this. It was like a moment of self-actualization. And like w the set was great and everything felt good. And yeah. it, was, it was a really cool moment when I realized we were doing it for real. And mm -hmm. we weren't just showing up with... Uh, our gear and you know like make you noise. We, we, yeah, we, yeah. Had our, we had our shit together for the first time, I think, and cool. yeah, that was a cool moment. Tell me something about Canada. So I'm Mi'kmaq, which yeah. is a tribe from Nova Scotia, and um, so Crown Lands is land that's owned by the monarch, and it's land that you can camp on for like two weeks, and you're good. But it's also used for things that we don't necessarily agree with, like clear cutting forests and stuff like that. And um, so, me being Mi'kmaq, I just feel, I feel a deep connection to nature in Canada. I spend a lot of time up in Algonquin Park, and I grew up around Roseneath, and, uh, and visited, and spent a lot of time at the reservations down there. And, you know, seeing the conditions that they're living in right now is not 
something that I agree with at all. And so I think crown lands uh, can be used in so many different ways to express that, like, you know, hey, this awareness. is happening now. Yeah, yeah, awareness, exactly. Crown land is, is land that like our own citizens are living on right now in third world conditions. Not everyone is, but there's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, neglect for our own people going on in this country. And, you know, Gord Downey paved the way for uh, talking about that with, with art. And that's what we want to do is uh, spread a message of, of hope and that, you know, we, we can band together because, you yeah. know, by, by being called Crownlands, it's, it's our way of reclaiming that authority from, uh, from the Federal Reserve. We're claiming it you know, for ourselves and for everyone around us and a message of, of hope for the future that we can reconcile our, our past 150 years of colonial horror that, you know, we've, we've done great injustice to people and it's time to make right. Yeah. And so that's human rights and environmental Absolutely, rights. Absolutely, yeah. We like to paint ourselves as, you know, a shining beacon of hope, for, uh, especially for immigration, you know. Yeah. I think what we represent on the international stage is, you know, for a lot of people who uh, otherwise would have to, you know, stay in, in a war-torn country. They, there's mm. there's a beacon of a, a new beginning in Canada. Yeah, or opportunity yeah. that they wouldn't have um, otherwise. But right. we have a lot of shit to figure out. Yeah, you exactly. Know, and, you know, I'll, you just take it one day at a time and, you know, through art and through um, international policy and, you know, internal policy, I think we can absolutely make a, a positive change and, and do right by people we've neglected for hundreds of years now. Uh -huh. The path yeah. is not so secret anymore. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So there's a band called Gas Station Mentality. And we opened up uh, and closed the set as well yeah. um, uh, in in Cornwall, and they they were up there like this power trio that played jazz fusion instrumental metal all over prog the place. Rock. Yeah. Wow. And so we're playing this tiny dive bar, which is amazing. Like the the venue is awesome. I love playing Cornwall. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain crowd that expects a certain kind of music, and we kind of sort of fulfill that. Yeah, you know, yeah. we kind of like we're on the cusp of like playing like blues rock, and the cusp of going into, you know, the the, the universe of prog. Yeah. And these guys had no pretensions; they were full on prog. Yeah, they were and straight up like Tool meets Mahavishnu Orchestra. <laughs> yeah. And Wow. It, it, the bar just emptied out. It, it, it was, I felt so bad. Like, we I, loved it. Like, I we just kept looking so around much. more and more. And I was just standing yeah. in the front, like just watching this incredible band. But by, by the yeah. end of their set, it was just Cody and I. And yeah, we, no we were kidding. we were rocking out so hard. But it was a bummer that they all left. That's funny though, because uh, Frank Zappa. That's why he liked Alice Cooper. Yeah. Because everybody left. <laughs> so where do we find you guys online then? Uh, Crownlands Music on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and uh, you can visit us at crownlands.ca. Well, thanks for being on Musicians in Bars Getting Beer, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Billy. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for being on. Thank you so much, Billy.